Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming to the symposium this year. This was the 23rd symposium, the 24th anniversary of the founding of Sirius. Next year will be the 25th anniversary, which uh, when I sort of started this out, I didn't dream of it going as it has and continuing to grow, but I'm glad that it is, and I'm glad that you're here to share this with us and that you have concern about the area. Uh, we have already scheduled next year's symposium. It will be March 28th and 29th, and you're all cordially invited to participate. Of course, we have events during the year. You're also welcome to partake of those, including our weekly seminar series. Um, I am just delighted to introduce our speaker for the end of the symposium, our, our closing keynote. Um, Dick and I met back in 1998, I think, and we've crossed paths quite a few times since then in various uh, ways. Uh, I'm not going to go through and, and recount his biography. You've got the handout. Uh, he knows who he is. You could read it. Uh, but he has played an important role in national security and infrastructure protection. Back when I met him, uh, we were probably two of you know, maybe a dozen people who really cared about security at the time <laughs> in the cyberspace arena, uh, and certainly it's grown since then. He's going to talk about a, a, a fascinating topic that few people can uh, speak with as definitively as he can, given his time in government and his time as a consultant and his time as an author of some very interesting fiction. Uh, you ought to check out his books if you haven't. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, we're in a hybrid war. So please join me in welcoming the esteemed Richard A. Clark. Thank you. I want you to know that the only reason I came here was so that I could hear Spaff say that. <laughs> because it's a very high honor to have him say that. And, but you know him. Um, so hybrid warfare. Hybrid warfare is what we are in. Uh, and it is very much dependent on IT. Uh, and we're probably in the early stages, maybe, uh, of a major hybrid war. So let's talk about that. How does IT make hybrid war possible? What is hybrid war? So about a month ago, uh, the wolf uh, dropped the sheep's clothing. About a month ago, we were able finally, uh, in case anyone had doubted it before, uh, to see that Vladimir Putin is an amoral sociopath. Most of us uh, in the national security business knew that for a long time. But now the world knows it. And what he has embarked upon here, he's done before. Uh, he's trying out uh, things from a playbook that he's utilized in other parts of the world. And it goes under the heading, uh, according to uh, his top general, uh, General Gerasimov, who may or may not still be with us, I'm not sure. Um, general Gerasimov uh, gave a famous uh, lecture at the Russian Military Academy about hybrid war and how Russia would use it uh, in the future. So what is hybrid war? Hybrid war, according to General Gerasimov, is designed to substitute or augment conventional war. To substitute for regular weapons, tanks and things, uh, or, or to augment them. The key thing about hybrid war is that the people who do it don't look like the military. They're not in national military uniforms. They may not be in the military at all. But what they do in hybrid war is designed to disrupt the enemy and to 
sow dissent in the enemy ranks. There are lots of pieces to hybrid war, but the two I want to talk to you about uh, are the two that use IT. And they are disinformatia, as the Russians would call it, uh, disinformation, and cyber attacks. Separate things. Disinformatia is something that the Soviet Union and before that the Tsar uh, have been practicing for over 100 years. Uh, it is embedded in every Russian soldier, Russian officer in their military academy, that one of the tools in your uh, toolbox is what they call maskarovka, camouflage, concealment, and deception, emphasis on the deception. Uh, and it can be done and should be done before as well as during the war. And it can be done at the tactical level, where you make weapon systems that are actually made out of plywood so the enemy can see them and blow them up. It can be done at the strategic level, where you try to change the leadership or the opinions of the country that you're fighting. I first came across Russian disinformatia in the 1980s uh, when I was working in the Reagan administration, yes, I'm that old, um, in the intelligence uh, part of the State Department. And we had an ambassador from an African country, an American ambassador to an African country, who was visiting, and I said, well, what are, what are the problems you're seeing in Africa? And he said, well, the major one uh, is, of course, that the United States invented HIV AIDS. I said, excuse me? What? Uh, he said, yeah, the Worcester Institute uh, on the corner of 33rd Street and Spruce in Philadelphia, right off the Penn campus. The Worcester Institute invented AIDS, and it's designed to kill black people. I didn't know what to say to this guy. I didn't know if he was kidding or if he was insane. Or... He said, that's what everybody in Africa believes. How could that be? It's the, it's the most laughable thing I have ever heard, especially if you know the Wistar Institute. The Russians had been placing that story, the Soviets had been placing that story all over Africa, buying newspaper editors, buying TV and radio people to spread that story. And it was just accepted by everybody in Africa, and no one in Washington knew it until then, until it was too late. The effect that had on our image in Africa probably continued un until George W. Bush uh, did an incredible thing, and that was to pay for all of the HIV AIDS treatment in Africa, which we're still doing. The Russians had that effect with the big lie, the outrageous lie. They had that effect before the internet. When the internet came along, those same people eventually realized what they could do with the internet and IT technology to spread lies. And there is a very large bureaucracy uh, in Russia that does that every day. And it doesn't just do it directed at the United States, it does it directed all over the world with lots of different themes. Now, I, I'm going to warn you that what I'm about to say is going to sound partisan. I don't mean it to. Uh, but it's going to sound a little bit uh, like perhaps the Democratic Party talking points. It's not. Uh, this is factual, pure, factual, I can footnote, I can send you to congressional studies, I can send you to intelligence reports. They began seriously working the United States uh, in 2015 and 2016 in terms of affecting our election. They created tens of thousands of American personas on every 
social media you've heard of and many that you have not heard of. They sent agents into the United States to help them make those postings credible by learning more about our culture and narrowing in on particular zones and particular cities. They were able to be so convincing that they organized rallies in the United States at which thousands of people showed up. And they organized those rallies pretending to be Americans and they did it all from St. Petersburg. They were able to get American citizens to spend their money out of their pocket to make fake jail cells, to buy a prison jumpsuit and a blonde wig, and to get an American woman to go sit in a fake jail cell pretending to be Hillary Clinton in a jail cell in a jumpsuit. And the orders for that to happen originated in St. Petersburg and were carried out by Americans who thought they were talking to other Americans. That's how extreme it was. Now you can go on and on about the 2016 election, but realize they did that and that's disinformation. They didn't stop there. They went on and to continue their campaign because they found a vein in the United States that responded to them. And we now know that a lot of the anti-vax propaganda and the anti-vax personas that were on the internet beginning in 2020 were either created in Russia or amplified by Russia. And if you have any doubt about that, go and look at those anti-vax media sites, websites, personas in social media. And today, what are they doing? They're saying how great Putin is and how the United States provoked him to invade Ukraine and how Ukraine deserved to be invaded. There is a one-for-one -one correlation in what those websites are saying and what those personas are saying. That we're anti-vax and are now pro-Ukrainian invasion, pro-Putin. You can directly trace individual stories. One example I will give you is the United States is in a joint program with Ukraine to make biological weapons. You know, excuse my French, but that's bullshit. There's absolutely no truth to that. Nothing near truth to that. The United States doesn't even have biological weapons. But that story is widely believed in a number of places around the world. And you can trace it from when it first popped up on Russian media sites. And how then it moved from Russian media sites to US social media sites. Verbatim, talking points. And how it then moved from those US social media sites to certain American congressmen and senators and on to certain American TV networks. And so there are Americans today who go and get their news from those websites and from those TV networks who believe that the government in Washington that they don't trust for all sorts of good reasons. I worked in it, I don't trust it either. Should never trust the government that that government is lying to them and that government was involved in the biological weapons program and that's why Putin invaded Ukraine. And if you think that story is having some effect here, which it is, it's all over India. It's widely believed in India. Every mainstream talk show in India is talking about it. 
That's hybrid warfare. That's one example of hybrid warfare. The use of disinformation to justify what you're doing, to discredit your opponent, but if you are really good at it, to cause disruption and dissent in the enemy camp. January 6th is the culmination of disinformation. January 6th is exactly what this was all about. To cause the physical manifestation, to cause Americans by the thousands to physically manifest the propaganda line originating in Russia. So it was going on before Ukraine, but it is now going on about Ukraine. The good news is that for the vast majority of Americans, it's not working. It's not working on the Ukraine part. The vast majority of Americans, if you look at the polls, support everything that the United States and NATO have been doing to support the Zelensky government in Ukraine. So it's not penetrating um, because it's ludicrous. And we can all see what's going on in Ukraine by turning on CNN. So it's hard to overcome that. But in other cases where you can't go on CNN and see truth, see it with your own eyes, in other cases, gullible Americans are being duped. Some of them know it, and some of them don't. And that is what hybrid warfare looks like. But the other aspect of it, and the one I think closer to Spaff's heart and the heart of most of you here, uh, is cyber warfare. Uh, I wrote a book 14 years ago now, something like that, uh, with Robert Kanaki called Cyber War. Uh, and a sequel 10 years later called The Fifth Domain. When Cyber War came out, uh, we got one review in the newspaper that said, file under fiction. None of the things that they, these guys talk about in this book could ever really happen. That was a while ago. Where we are today, fascinating difference. The President of the United States has on three occasions publicly warned Russia not to engage in a cyber war against the United States. The President of the United States has called in dozens of CEOs of major American companies to tell them a cyber war is about to happen and they need to do things. The President of the United States has told Russia that if you engage in cyber attacks on the United States, we will respond in kind. And if you poll CEOs today of major companies, uh, if you poll uh, administrators of state and local governments and say, are you concerned about cyber war? Right now the answer is yes from almost all of them. So it went from being something that was laughable and couldn't happen to total acceptance and a high priority. I don't know when that shift occurred, but I think the war in Ukraine marks a major milestone in people's acceptance that cyber war can happen. People have asked me, well, you know, if, if you, you keep warning about how the Ukraine war is going to spill over into the United States in, in, as a cyber war. Why hasn't that happened? Why aren't we in a cyber war? We are. We are in a cyber war. There are three theaters of this cyber war. One is Ukraine, where the Russians have tried very, very hard to knock off communications. Uh, they knocked off the satellite based system for Ukrainian military command and control. They have attempted to knock off the major internet providers and have had some limited success. They've taken down most of the government websites. 
taking down most of the 911 systems. They've done a lot. But it hasn't succeeded. This is one of the great lessons that we will take away from the Ukraine war, and there's a long list of lessons. But one of them is, try as the GRU might to cripple Ukrainian systems through cyber war. They have largely failed. And when they have succeeded in taking down the system, the Ukrainians have gotten it back up or gotten a substitute back up within a matter of days. Why is that? Two reasons. One, this is not the first war between Ukraine and Russia. This started in 2014 when the Russians took Crimea. And as part of their hybrid war, the troops that did that were the famous little green men. So-called little green men because they wore green uniforms that said nothing on them about Russia. Remember when I said the definition of hybrid war? Don't make it look like it's your military. The Russians denied that it was their military that took over Crimea. It was just locals. Local special forces. <laughs> so the Ukrainians started getting ready in 2015 for the inevitable war, big war with Russia, that they knew would come. Their military was pathetic in 2014. They had 6,000 troops that they could put on into combat, 6,000. They've totally rebuilt their military. You can see the results today. And as part of that, they built one of the best defensive systems for cyber attacks anywhere in the world. And they have partners. They have partners from every major European government and they have partners from every major American cybersecurity firm. Now, I'm not going to say the names of those firms, but you can go to, the, uh, you can go to your stock index and look up cybersecurity firms, and they're all publicly traded. <clears throat> they don't want to attract attention. They don't want to have this, the Russians target them. But there are people in Silicon Valley today who are directly tied into Kiev uh, and who are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with the Ukrainian cyber defenders to keep that, those networks back up and to get them back up, up when they come down. Intelligence is flowing at a rate I've never seen before. And intelligence just doesn't come from U.S. intelligence agencies. Intelligence in this business comes from cybersecurity firms <laughs> as much as it does from NSA and CIA. So in the first theater of cyber war, there is a battle going on in Ukraine. The Russians are doing as much as they can do, and the Ukrainians are holding them off in cyberspace just as in physical space. The second theater of this cyber war is Russia. Who is attacking Russia? people from all around the world in an uncoordinated way. You've heard about Anonymous doing attacks. They are a small group uh, of the greater picture of hackers, white hat, gray hat, black hat, vigilante hackers who are doing some fun things and some doing some serious things. They are, the fun thing is they're getting the news through to Russian people that they can't get on their state-run media about what's going on in Ukraine. They're doing that by such brilliant ideas as having home printers print off the news. But there is a real risk here. Cyber war, just like nuclear war, they were very different, but there are some similarities. Escalation has to be carefully controlled, or it can get out of hand. Miscommunication, misunderstanding, 
of what the other side is doing can be very, very dangerous. Russia today could be forgiven for thinking that we, the United States, are attacking them. Because people in the United States are attacking them. And they mirror image a lot. They know that hackers in Russia are not allowed to hack targets in the United States without Russian government approval. And if you doubted that before, there's a treasure trove of new material that hackers have been able to pull in the last month from these criminal organizations uh, that have been doing ransomware. And there it is in their own communications about how they coordinate with the FSB and they coordinate with the GRU. So the Russians may well think that when hackers in the United States or the Netherlands or France or Germany are attacking them, it's with government permission. That is putting pressure, I'm afraid, on the Russian leadership to bring this cyber war to the third theater, which is here. They haven't done that yet. We'll talk in a minute about why they may not have done that yet. But they've done it in the past. In both Ukraine and in the United States, they engaged in dry runs. They engaged in dry runs both for very targeted attacks and for indiscriminate attacks. Let's start with the targeted attacks. On two occasions, the Russian military, the GRU, hackers, collapsed parts of the Ukrainian power grid, knocking it offline. Now, the fact that they did that is probably one of the reasons it hasn't happened again. Because the Ukrainians, with the help of their friends, figured out how that was done and made it more difficult to do. But they did a targeted attack twice against the, the Ukrainian power grid, shutting it down. And for those of us who live on the East Coast, we remember uh, not being able to get gasoline last year because the Colonial Pipeline, uh, which brought most of the gas and most of the jet fuel to the East Coast and Northeast, uh, was attacked by a Russian hacker group. Targeted attacks. If the Russians choose to respond to our sanctions, we'll talk about that in a sec, one of the targets will surely be things like refineries and pipelines because they want to put pain and pressure on our economy and on our leadership just as our economic sanctions have put pain and pressure on their economy and their political leadership. The place to do it is pipelines and refineries. We're going to replace some of the Russian LNG that is going to Europe. Well, we're only going to do that if two export terminals in Louisiana and Texas are functioning. And let me tell you, they both rely a lot on IT. I could say more that would be depressing, but I won't. Targeted attacks. They also did indiscriminate attacks, both in Ukraine and in the United States. The famous case of NotPetya, does everyone know what NotPetya was? I assume in this audience, most people do. NotPetya was taking a software provider in Ukraine, a software provider that made the tax and audit accounting that everyone used in Ukraine. Think of it as uh, QuickBooks or something more enterprise focused. They got into the build for the software. They got in for, into the software supply chain, into the software update. Uh, and put a piece of malware that looked like it was the Petya ransomware. But it was not Petya. It was, in fact, wiperware. 
and it wiped out all of the software on all of the networks. So routers, servers, printers, laptops, mobile phones, desktop IP phones had no software on them and were useless except as doorstops. And that was the Russian GRU. They did a similar, and, and by the way, when I say it's an indiscriminate attack, not only did they do that to thousands of Ukrainian companies, but as you probably know, it jumped out from Ukraine and wiped out companies around the world. Wiped out the largest uh, port management firm uh, in the world, Maersk, Maersk Shipping. Ports all over the world ground to a halt. The big cranes that move containers all over the world stopped in midair. In the United States, Merck Pharmaceuticals, their production line in New Jersey stopped running. And these facilities were down for weeks. And in the particularly nasty thing, the, the virus hit the maker of Oreo cookies. <laughs> it was the largest case of cyber damages in history. The insured losses exceed $1.5 billion. Totally indiscriminate attack. But they did it here too. Solar winds. Solar winds is the classic software supply chain attack. And it is a technique that to this day we don't have a good solution for. You want a good research project for somebody? Tell me how to stop solar winds style software supply chain attacks. They got into the build process at a company that was widely used, 14,000 customers. They put an incredibly sophisticated zero day uh, into that build. And SolarWinds pumped it out to its 14,000 companies as the monthly software update. No detection system caught it. 14,000 leading American companies, federal departments, none of them in the techniques that they used to scan software before they put it on their networks, none of them caught it. And this was not two lines of code. This is a very complex piece of malware. It ran for months on thousands of American companies and no one caught it. And we can name the very sophisticated cyber products from very good American companies that were running on these networks. You know, in my consulting business, when somebody says to me, well, well you know, do I need an EDR, do I need an MDR? Yes, buy this one, buy that one. None of them worked. And by luck, one of the companies that was hit was FireEye Mandiant. And by luck, months into the hack, one very astute fellow noticed an anomaly and pulled the thread. That's how he discovered it. Totally indiscriminate attack in thousands of companies. I'd love to do a poll of this audience and ask the question, was SolarWinds the only one they did that to? No, it's the only one we've caught. So as bad as they're doing in Ukraine, there's reason to believe that if they wanted to bring the war, the cyber war, to this theater, the third theater, it would have some devastating effects. So why hasn't it happened? I don't know. I found in dealing with American presidents that when they ask you a question, occasionally answering it that way gives you credibility. <laughs> I have the vaguest idea. The only possible explanation that I have not been able to invalidate is that we have deterred them. And 
if you read Cyber War or you read The Fifth Domain, I go on for pages about how we can't deter them. How our saying, we'll do cyber war to you if you do cyber war to us, won't stop them because they can take the heat. They can take the pain. A, they're less technologically dependent uh, on network systems, and B, there are not going to be a lot of people protesting in the streets. But it's just possible I'm entirely wrong about that. When Joe Biden said to them, if you engage in cyber war, we will do the same to you, that may have had an effect. Because even though we think Putin can lock everybody up, and we think Putin can suppress dissent, even he is worried about the mob. Even he is worried about uprisings. If there's one thing we know from looking at his conversations with interlocutors over the course of the last 10 years, 20 years, 10 years he's been talking about the terrible color revolutions, the orange revolution in Ukraine, the green revolution in Iran, the Arab Spring where dictators were killed. He obsesses about that. Reportedly, he's watched the video of Muammar Gaddafi being brutally killed over and over and over. Fear of the mob. I had a professor at the Kennedy School who uh, taught us that if you're trying to analyze somebody sitting across the table from you, try to find out what were the formative traumatic events in their life, in their professional life. Because even though the world has changed, they're still concerned about that kind of thing. Well, for Vladimir Putin, when the Berlin Wall fell, he was a young major in the KGB in East Germany, in Dresden, and the mob came down the street with torches, placards, and they went for his building, the KGB building. And they were going to do to it what they had done to the secret police, the Stasi, down the street. And he had to summon up all of his courage and get two other KGB guys and stand on the steps of that building with a rifle and ward off the mob. So. That's a very vivid image in his mind, which has been reinforced by the color revolutions. I think he's actually worried that if we really did a cyber attack, a major cyber attack on his economy, we could make it even worse. And if you've seen the videos of riots in stores in Moscow, riots over when they bring the sugar out to put the sugar on the shelves, complete mayhem, people fighting each other to get the bags of sugar. Because the economic effects, the economic sanctions are already having some effect. So maybe we've deterred him. Or maybe we've just deterred him for now. And as the economic sanctions grind harder and harder on his economy, maybe the voices in his councils who are telling him, retaliate, retaliate against the United States. Maybe he will. So if you think about the sort of escalatory ladder, I don't know if any of you ever read Herman Kahn's book on escalation. It's 1966, so you probably haven't. But I went back and found it. And Kahn goes into great detail about the escalatory ladder. Uh, in conflict and, and how you have to control it and how you have to be intentional about movement from one stage to another. And how you can signal with it and how you can miscommunicate. That's why I worry about the vigilantism. But the escalatory ladder here is Russia invades Ukraine, step one. Step two, the United States, the EU, the G7 slap on really draconian, unprecedentedly draconian economic sanctions. 
There's a joke going around Moscow. What's the difference between a, uh, a dollar and a, and a ruple? A dollar. <laughs> these, these are sanctions that are really, really hurting. Well, the next step on the escalatory ladder is likely ramping up that hybrid warfare, going to the third theater, and attacking the United States, the EU, uh, in cyberspace and causing economic damage to us, causing pipeline damage to us. Could still happen. But Biden didn't just tell Putin, if you do it, I'll do it back to you in spades. He also, as I said earlier, he brought in all the American CEOs. He brought in all the American CEOs and said, you can improve your security, and you don't have a lot of time to do it. But we will open up the intelligence treasure trove. We will share information. We will cut through the bullshit and cut through the red tape, and we will work with you to go shields up. Now, when I heard that, I was a little mad, because about 18 months ago, uh, I wrote an essay and spread it around to everybody, saying, in a period of crisis, you can, to quote Star Trek, go shields up. And I didn't trademark it. <laughs> and now if you go to the Homeland Security Department, CISA's webpage, what does it say in giant letters? Shields up! Well, can you really do that? Can you really do things day to day, and then in a period of crisis, in a period when you are anticipating an attack, do different things, do more, can you? Uh, I argued about two years ago that you could. There were a series of things that most companies aren't doing, and they could do. Uh, I published that then. Uh, Mandiant has published a similar one since most of the cybersecurity companies have published a similar list. Uh, CISA at Homeland uh, has compiled those and refined it, uh, and they have their list. But since this is Indiana, and that great son of Indiana, David Letterman, uh, invented the top ten list, uh, I'm going to give you my top ten list. Uh, in terms of how you go shields up. Uh, and then I'm going to trademark it. <laughs> the first one is patch, 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 patch. Do not wait for the one day a month that you patch. Patch, at least during this period of heightened tensions, at least during the time when your shields are up, patch when the patch comes in. And trust... <laughs> Trust that it doesn't have malware in it. <laughs> While you're at patching, go back and look. This is still number one. Go back and look at your risk register. Every company has a risk register. Every company has a cybersecurity chapter of its risk register. And nobody ever looks at it except to create it so that when the audit firms come along, they can show it to them. To the extent that your risk register has any semblance of reality to it, pull forward some of the things that you are going to do next year. If there are high-level category, red category, risks that you are running and you were going to do them Address them next year, address them now. If you need more money for that, get more money for that. I know I tell all my clients you can't do everything in a year, you need a three-year plan, blah, blah, blah. Take a look at your high-level risks in your risk register and pull forward the ones that are most appropriate. Number two, get more eyes on glass now. Make sure that that SOC is staffed 24-7, and if you don't have the people to do that, hire an MSSP. 
or shift people over from the IT department. The speed with which you identify the problem and act determines the effect of the, of the attack. And if no one's seeing it, if it's lost in a series of alarms, uh, the damage can be done in a matter of minutes. So more eyes on glass. Number three, yeah, multi-factor authentication, but multi-factor authentication with a physical key. And the federal government's policy now is zero trust, zero trust, zero trust. Yeah. Zero trust says find all sorts of places where you aren't using MFA or aren't using authentication at all and install MFA and please do it with a physical key because as we know there are ways around other forms of MFA. Number four, take a look at your backup. You may find it shocking the number of major companies and enterprises whose backup is online. Anybody see a problem with that? Have your backup offline and have it at varying intervals in time going back as far as you can go back. Because you may have backed up malware and if you mount it, it may again affect your system. In which case, go back to the next one. Have offline backup for multiple periods in time. Number five, go to active blocking. Companies have invested lots of money in data loss prevention tools, uh, DLP and other things which they have on alarm. Well, during this period where the shields are up, take the switch, move it over from alarm to block. Yes, you will block good stuff. That's fine. The world won't end. People will complain to you. And when they complain to you, you can let it go. If someone you know calls up and says you, that you've blocked them, they have a Russian accent, probably not. <laughs> Number six, get a tip. Get a threat intelligence program. There are lots of companies out there, um, probably too many, but there are lots of companies out there who provide really good threat intelligence information, and they will give it to you days before CISA will give it to you. And days matter. So buy your intelligence. Number seven, block inward and outward DNS domains and IP addresses that you don't need. Your enterprise, your institution doesn't need to be communicating with everybody in the world. There are vast blocks of DNS and IP that you can just block, inbound and outbound. And you can get a daily update uh, on what those domains are from your threat intelligence company. Number eight, educate the workforce. The workforce wants to be part of the solution. But if all you tell them is they have to change their password every time they go to the bathroom, they're not going to do it. Have an all-hands meeting, virtual or in person. Go back to World War II style, put up posters. You know, loose lips sink ships. Tell them if they think it's phishing, what to do. Educate them about how to identify phishing. Give them prizes if they successfully identify phishing. Make it a competition. Make it fun. And tell them why all of these additional security measures are being put into effect. Appeal to their patriotism.
Number nine, find somewhere in the filing cabinet at the back of the room, covered in dust, your incident response plan and your business continuity plan, which are two different things. Dust them off, see if they make sense, and update them. Why are they two different things? An incident response plan tells you what to do when something has just happened. And how do you run the crisis? And there, a good incident response plan is fairly complex. And it should be tailored to your company. The business continuity plan is how do you run the business while it's down? How do you run the business while nothing over here is working? Finally, the Transportation Security Agency uh, recently told the railroads that by the end of June, uh, they have to have a business continuity plan uh, that tells the government how are they going to run the railroad when their network has been hacked and isn't available. Well, we all need that, not just the railroads. We all need an incident response plan, and we all need a business continuity plan that tells us how we're going to work when nothing works. Quick war story. You all remember when North Korea the leader of North Korea, the dear leader of North Korea, um, got very upset about a movie that Sony was going to release. Uh, and they launched a piece of wiperware, remember wiperware, not Petya, uh, against Sony. Sony Pictures Entertainment, just that division. I happened to be in uh, LA that day and I got a call, could you come over? Uh, and so I went, drove up to the gate, it was a big Hollywood lot, and the security guard looked at me and said, no, I don't need to see your ID. I can't look up on the computer to see if, you're, if you have an appointment because the computer doesn't work. And I can't print you out a parking pass or a building pass because the computer doesn't work. So just go in. So I walked in to the lobby, the beautiful Art Deco lobby uh, at Sony. And, and there were two young women handwriting out paychecks in a long line of people. And as they walked up to the head of the line, the woman would say to them, how much do you get paid? It was payday. They wanted to make sure everybody was paid. But they had no ADP system, no personnel, no way of doing that. So they trusted everybody. And they hand wrote out paychecks, which is nice, right? Considerate. I then walked into the boardroom, uh, and they were all all these executives were complaining uh, that they would had to stop making mo movies. They had all these actors on the lot that were sitting around doing nothing. Nothing was working. Uh, the, the iPhones didn't work. The IP phones on the desk didn't work. Nothing worked. The cameras didn't work in the, in the studios. And then some guy broke into the meeting with a shoebox and it had about a dozen blackberries in it. And he said, I found the blackberries and they still work. <laughs> and I then got to see 20 really highly paid Hollywood executives fight each other over who was going to get the blackberry. So it's nice to have a business continuity plan that will tell you how you're going to run the enterprise when nothing works. And number 10, drum roll. Take that incident response plan and exercise it. If you don't understand the importance of exercising it in the real world as real as you can get, talk to your basketball coach. You can have the best game plan in the world. He would never think of putting the Purdue basketball team out on the field, out on the court with a really good plan for the game if they hadn't exercised it. And yet company after company around the United States has an incident response plan covered in dust that has never seen the light of day in the C-suite. Never been exercised involving the real CEO or the real COO or the real CFO. 
if ever there is a time to exercise response plans, it's now. Because the difference in companies that have done that and companies that haven't, when the real thing happens, is night and day. So my motto for this is never let a cyber crisis, never let your first cyber crisis be a real one. Have as real as you can get a cyber crisis now. That's what I would do. There are lots of other suggestions for going shields up. That's my top 10 list. But the important message is that the president is telling companies to go shields up. And no longer do we have the problem that we had for a couple of decades of people thinking we were mad uh, in talking about cyber war. Now we're in one, and the only question is, will it come here? So let me stop there. I know we've got time limits. Um, be glad to take any reasonable, uh, decent questions. <laughs> All right, so this may be an unreasonable, unfair question, and so if you say, I don't know, I totally understand. But in simplistic terms, there's kind of a race right now between how many Ukrainians will die and when the Russians will pull out, and maybe possibly when Putin is no longer in power. Any smart guys speculating or thinking about that, or if they are, we don't know it. Oh, there are lots of smart guys speculating about it. No one knows what they're talking about, though. Um, the, the, the thing about this Ukrainian war has been how humiliating it has been for experts and prognosticators. Um, the, the room that you could fill with all of the experts that said the Russian military was pathetic um, would be a very small phone booth. Nobody said that. I'm looking. If you find them, let me know. I'd love to find that person because I wrote a book, Warnings, about finding people who could see things in advance. I have still not found the person who said the Russian military is pathetic and it will fall apart if you use it. Um, I don't think we know. Uh, I don't think we know how long the Ukrainian military can be sustained by NATO um, and by its own people, obviously. I don't know how long um, people in the Kremlin will put up with Putin. I think it's very hard to get rid of him. But I said that about other leaders like Gaddafi, and you know, Gaddafi ended up in the ditch. So it's, it's the right question, uh, and we could do all sorts of sensitivity analysis on it, but basically we don't know. Thank you. Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark. I'm Michael Clark, and I've got a dumb question, and I mean That's, this in all sincerity. There are no dumb questions. Well, dumb I, answers, but give me give me a shot. I might surprise you. Um, <laughs> this is not meant to be challenging. This is not meant to be disrespectful. I am I'm asking this in sincerity. Your top ten list. Your first one was patch, patch, patch. I've got 34 years in the industrial automation sector. I've worked for all the bigs. I've never worked for a vendor. I've always worked on the end user side of the equation in critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They have enormous allergic reactions to patches. Oh, I know. And I would like your opinion on what is being done or how instructions are being received or sent to the very vendor who is creating the patch and why they can't get it right. I've seen entire refineries brought to their knees yep. by patching. Yep. I was there. And internet providers. And, and I got a burn from the flare. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm saying is yep. these guys are highly allergic reactions yep. to, to patching. So, so forgive I, me, but no, no, I accept, advise. I accept that. There's a reason 
why people only patch once a month and then they don't even do that. Um, I get that. You are talking um, more OT or IT than OT? I'm talking I, IT, not OT. But there's a similar problem with IT. Um, nobody wants to put a patch on a major complex corporate enterprise network without simulating it, uh, without running it in a sandbox. Um, and that takes a lot of time and money and staff, and you can't be doing that all the time or you'll never be doing anything else. I get that. But if you can't patch do at least a workaround, if the vendor says this is a high priority patch and includes a security function, now, if they don't tell you what the security function is, that's a problem right there. Go back and insist that they tell you and, and do it as a community. But if they tell you there is a security problem being solved with this patch and you can't get to it, then disable the system or build around the system. Isolate the system. Maybe you can't do that either, but at least think about it. Because there is an alternative between saying, I'm going to patch it right away, and I'm never going to patch the damn thing. There is an alternative, which is build a workaround. And I can't tell you how to do that because it's unique in every case. It's probably easier in OT than in IT. I don't know. OT has their own sandboxes for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Well, as we know, um, Sophisticated malware now tests to see if it's in the sandbox. Um, <laughs> so there's, you know, we all, we all started out playing in sandboxes. We're all back there, you know. When we were three, we were playing in sandboxes and fighting in, in sandboxes. And now there's a war going on in sandboxes between malware and, and detection systems. Um, I realize that saying patch, 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 I don't literally mean take anything that comes in and immediately put it on. But I do mean pay a lot more attention at, to patches that come on and say there's a security problem being solved. And when that happens, in a period when you are shields up. Follow up. With patching right now, this is the prime time to sneak something under the radar. Mm -hmm. Stick it wicked any time. Yeah. Um, and that's why I suggested this is a great research topic. Um, I have yet to see a product in the market that is really reliable for looking at patches. Uh, and I mean, you can do all sorts of code analysis, sure. But <clears throat> most of those, none of those code analysis tools that are out there are designed specifically to look at patches. Um, maybe they don't have to be, you know, maybe you can just take Veracode and run it on everything, I don't know. Um, but um, it's, a, it's, it's a problem that we haven't properly addressed. We know there is an attack vector, it's been used. You would think Silicon Valley would be falling all over itself coming up with a new product uh, to address that new attack vector. I haven't seen it. It's not sexy. No, no this not, you know, a lot of this isn't sexy. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Shields up. Thank you so much. And with that, we are done with this year's uh, Serious Security Symposium. <clears throat> I would encourage you to Continue your connections with us. <clears throat> Our Wednesday afternoon seminars uh, continue to be available online through YouTube and otherwise. We have great research projects. We have wonderful students, many of whom are going to be on the job market shortly. So those of you who are looking, please keep that in mind. And be safe out there. Uh, we we'll look forward to see you at our next event. So thank you very much for coming.